We are back for round two. Your last appearance was quite popular, ton of feedback. And since the last one, you have uh, written this book, which is amazing, The Rain Barrel Effect, which I absolutely love. Haven't dug into the whole thing yet, but I feel like it's going to be one of my favorite health and wellness books. Like You did such a great job with this. I appreciate that. Thanks. That was a, a long time in the making. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, we should have just recorded the last hour. We have I have so many different questions. But one thing that we talked about earlier that I didn't get to follow up on you because we were bouncing around talking about a million things was um, you mentioned something about uh, how a keto diet might not be good for certain people and certain you know vegan diet might not be good for certain people. So one thing I wanted to ask you because I think there's a lot of confusion about this is they say well they there's a lot of people that say if you have anxiety and ADHD and other kind of brain issues like that or whatever, you should go low carb and high fat. That's the only way. Now, other people will say, if you go low carb, your anxiety is going to be through the roof. So <laughs> what's what here? Yeah. So that's, that's always the thing. And that's, that's where I always find myself in this gray space. So everyone is willing to put themselves into a particular camp. So you're either in the keto camp, you know, obviously not just low carb, you're extremely low carb. But uh, well, one thing too, is a lot of people don't understand that they're not in keto. So like mm. when they're doing a keto based diet, you have to understand is that you have to have low protein as well. And I would love to be able to chat right. about low protein later and you have to have higher fat. So your fat can't, it, it has to be in ratio. So it has to be more like a four to one, you know, fat ratio to your carbs and your protein. But again, protein will actually spike blood sugar. And that's something that most yeah. people don't know. And protein at a higher rate can also be used with something called gluconeogenesis, which your liver will actually convert it to glucose. So it's very, very strange. It's, it's very, very funny in that way. But what I can always say is that most people, they, they can back that up. Like the keto experts will back it up with great research. But then also the people with high carb will back it up by great research. So you're like, well, who's right? And the truth is that they're always both right, but it's always figuring out who is it right for. Mm. So keto is not right for everyone. And so those same people with anxiety, so they'll say, okay, keto is great for people with mood-based issues, anxiety, fatigue, but here's why. It's because it controls blood sugar. So eventually when you start getting to more uh, keto, ketone-based processing, your blood sugar should stay level. It might actually stay on the lower side as well. So if your anxiety was due to highs and lows in blood sugar, which absolutely does, right? I mean, there's a lot of people who get irritable between meals, like, or if they go too long without eating, yeah. well, and they can get anxious. Well, of course, then the balancing out blood sugar is going to help a lot for them. But what if your anxiety didn't come from ups and downs in blood sugar? Mm. What if it actually came from a lack of serotonin-based production, right, which happens in the gut? Right. And if that's the case, well, what happens is your gut bacteria, which is helping to make that serotonin, is actually going to diminish on a keto-based diet. So a lot of people don't know your gut bacteria needs carbohydrates to thrive. It needs those prebiotics. And when you're down below 50 carbs a day, so it's shown that your microbiome starts to shrink. Okay. The actual, the, all those good probiotics starts to go away. Not, not completely, of course, because we don't have a sterile gut. So what happens is you may produce less serotonin. And the other thing is that a lot of people don't look at this as well, is that fats do not cut cortisol, protein does not cut cortisol, but carbohydrates mm -hmm. do. Yeah. So if your anxiety, which for the most part it is, with most people's anxiety is a fight or flight based issue because they're overwhelmed, there's too much to do, their nervous system's just on fire, it's carbohydrates. That's what we choose. Like that's what we think about, right? Carbs are going to be our comfort based food and that will, again, lower cortisol, which will then allow you to naturally produce more serotonin as well. Okay. So both can be right. Yeah. Yeah, that's tricky. And so the only way to know really is to do in-depth kind of testing and blood work and whatnot. To do in-depth testing, but again, you can, so I always recommend functional medicine lab testing because yeah. it gives you the answer. So I mean, like yeah. there's no more guessing. Yeah. So at some point, everyone gets to the point in their life where they say, all right, I'm done guessing and I'm just going to lab yeah. test. Okay. Yeah. So you can do that. You can also go say, how do I feel? But, you know, I was just having this conversation the other day that a lot of people feel great on keto for two months to three months. Right. And we always ask, well, why is that? And part of it is that the body's amazing at adapting in the short term, but really poor at doing that in the long term. Yeah. And I asked, like, was anyone ever meant to be on a keto diet for three months or four months? That's the question. I don't know if anybody really knows the answer to that, but I can assure you that your body does great with both carbs uh, on all macros, right? Fats and protein. Mm -hmm. And so if you were lower on carbs, let's say during a winter-based season, right, where you not didn't have access to fruit, Because that's like that. the argument people will make, right? Like... If you live through a winter, you could live on no carbs. 
Absolutely. Yeah. But eventually spring came. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so like, I don't think that we're supposed to be totally <laughs> right. deficient in, in one macro. Right. That's my thing. And so the, the thing I always ask people is this, because I don't have a, I, I always say I don't have a dog in the race. Like, yeah. I don't care who's the winner here. I'm going by the research and I'm also a clinician. So I see what works in my practice. Yeah. And what happens is this, is that after times, uh, the body is really missing those carbohydrates. So I ask you, if you're doing keto or extremely low carb, why is it that you're doing it? Are you doing it just to do it? Or are you doing it for body transformation? Are you doing it for health? Like, why are you doing it? Really ask yourself that because you might be able to get the results in a different way. Mm. Now, one of the other arguments about keto is longevity, which I never thought I'd hear that, but that's the thing nowadays. And, and the keto guys will say there's a ton of research pointing to that. Now, for me... You know, if you look at people who live to 100 in the blue zones, I would always have thought, and you pointed out in the book, that that doesn't sound like the best diet. Like, just logically, it doesn't make sense to me. Like, more fruits and vegetables, that's what people in all the blue zones eat. So, what's the deal with this? So there's all this research now. Oh, you got to keep inflammation and, and all this low, and, and that's how you're going to live forever. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's you know so there is a study on everything, right? Yeah, you can yeah. like you could pick any study you want, but here's the problem: you cannot extrapolate the data from keto being good for someone with cancer-based tumors mm. to general population. Right. It doesn't fit because one person is a massive anabolic growth of tumors. So what you're really saying by the keto-based diet is this, and I think that the research will prove this out in the long run, is that you are, of course, low blood sugar, right? So you're not feeding these cancerous tumors with Thrive in an acid-based and um, lactic acid-based environment, which uses sugar for that. But we can't say that 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 necessarily um, is the only factor as well. And that's going to help people without cancer. But the big thing is this, and that's why I'm happy that you brought this up, is that all the blue zones in keto as well as low protein, that I believe is going to be the missing factor. Mm -hmm. So back in my day- Which is really cool because you point that out in the book, which is something that I've said to people when they're super confused. You point out in the book, well, what do all these diets have in common? Mm -hmm. And you know, longevity and health-wise, it's like a lot of vegetables- Low protein, moderate amounts of fats, basically, right? That's right. Yeah. And so it, it's taking it to an extreme that's getting that that you can't get from the blue zones based diet. Meaning like there's not been a culture that I've seen that has thrived at seventy five percent of their diet from fat. Meaning there are cultures that have done it, but not longest lived. Mm. So when you look at people who have been on a, a predominantly, I would even say carnivore-based diet, where they've mainly had meat or fish as part of their diet, uh, or even the blood of animals, like when you look at some of the African-based tribes, they did not live out of their 60s. Okay. So we can look at it like, okay, um, and again, I love the Western Price Foundation, love their research, but he was not after who lived the longest. He was after who had um, not as many cavitations, right? Cavities in their in their yeah. mouth, but also less deformities and, and overall good health. And they did, but they weren't the longest lived people. Yeah. So going back to that, it's the protein. I really believe that. Mm. And here's why. They, that This study, I just talked about it um, on my, my podcast called um, The Mounting Evidence Against Meat. And again, like I, I'm someone coming from... Uh, 275 to 300 plus grams of protein a day. Like yeah. back in my day when I was trying to do natural bodybuilding, I tried to take this small frame of mind and make it enormous, right? Yeah. And, it, and it, you know, I worked. You can change your body to do anything that you want, but it wasn't healthy for me. So that was the big difference. But when I'm reading the research now, all of the research points to, and this is also why keto can get the same type of research, but keto most, most likely it's because of that low protein. Yeah. So what happens is you have lower levels of IGF-1 in the blood. And when you have lower levels of IGF-1, usually you live longer and you get less cancer. So they just did a groundbreaking study. This was done, um, I want to say a couple of years back, on over 4,000 people. And it looked at people in their 50s and older. What they found was this. They looked at three categories. 20% of your diet are more in protein. 10 to 19% would be considered moderate protein. And then less than 10% of your diet would be low protein. What they found was that the people who had 20% or more of their macros from their diet coming from protein. Now, it didn't matter necessarily whether it was plant or meat-based, but the people um, in the study who uh, did not live as long did eat more meat. So I just want to state that. Again, I'm not anti-meat, but I have to state that because that's what the research says. Yeah. But they had a 74% higher chance of dying during the study if they ate more than 19% of their diet from protein from all-cause mortality, meaning that the research showed that they were more likely to die of cardiovascular disease and cancer by having more protein in their diet. And this was a, across the board. I mean, this is like a huge monumental study. So what I'm saying is that the people who did the worst were those that got two-thirds of their protein um, from meat uh, because plant-based protein did better. But take that for what it's worth. Um, what I'm saying is this. If, if we don't draw straws and we just say, 
if 10 to 15% of your diet is protein, and maybe half of that is meat or animal-based products, well, you're going to be doing much better. Yeah. So what I look for is really that 80-20 rule of like, hey, 20%, like this is all you need to do, and you'll get 80% of the results. And so what I care about is helping people live longer, but not at the detriment of their health. Like I want them to live to, live to 100, but feel amazing. Mm. All right, so I got about 87 follow-up questions there. So so <laughs> one is, you, you mentioned the, uh, the carnivore diet, which is super popular now, so I just want to see if you have a take on that. Uh, I also want to address back for a second when we started with anxiety and whatnot, a lot of brain health experts are also saying low carb, low carb, low carb. Can you address that a little bit? Sure. Absolutely. And so the, they're saying low carb, be, carbs have nothing to do with it. It's all about blood sugar. Yeah. So, and it's about inflammation. Right. So take an ectomorph, uh, right now an ectomorph, they, and I do this. I'm again, this is all clinical base uh, and I'll, they'll eat a hundred grams of carbs at a meal and their blood sugar doesn't spike, hmm. and it doesn't crash. And so when you look at that ectomorph- now, How could someone, is there a way that someone could tell that? Absolutely, yeah. $20 on Amazon, buy a glucometer. Okay. And what you wanna do is you wanna just poke your finger with a little lancet, we were actually talking about this earlier. Yeah. You put a drop of blood on that little um, stick that goes into the glucometer. Again, anyone can do this, you do it for type two diabetes. And um, we can link up which one to get on Amazon if you want in your show notes. Okay. And then what you do is, what's your blood sugar before your meal? And it should be between 75 and 95. That's the number you're going to see read out. Okay. Now, take it a half hour after your meal. Take it another hour later and another hour later. And see what it comes to. Because by two to three hours after your meal, it should be back down below 95. Okay. And for the people that it doesn't, that's going to affect brain health, mm. their eye health, everything. Mm. But what if you don't have an issue with that? And I was going to say, so obviously they want to do the test. But is there a way you could tell just eating? Like some people... Say, oh, I want to, I want to go to sleep after I eat carbs. Where some people have could have 100 grams of carbs in a meal and feel fine. Is that like just a, a rough way of telling, or, or you say get the blood test? You can definitely do that. I yeah. mean, um, you can say, how do I feel after eating, yeah. and that is part of it. Um, but really, what I would say is, you can look at your body as well in the state that you're at right now. So let's say you're more than 30 pounds overweight, and a lot of that weight has kind of gone around your midsection, mm -hmm. whether it's around your belly or kind of love handles on the side. You most likely don't process carbohydrates very well. Mm -hmm. Maybe you are more of an endomorphic body type, or your body is just in a state of dysfunction right now. Like you have really high stress levels, and the higher amount of cortisol is allowing or making you store more body fat. And that's why a lot of people don't know, like I work with CrossFit athletes, like elite CrossFit athletes and, and elite, you know, who are athletes, whatever it might be. And they don't have a lot of carbs, but they do a hard workout and their blood sugar spikes. And it's like 200 plus, 300 plus, And they had zero carbs. So your sugar can actually spike anytime you're stressed. Like that's the amazing thing. Yeah. And so there's, there's so it gets a little bit involved. But what I would say is the brain health is not just about that. And you can make the same argument. I did a show called uh, The 14 Ways to, to Test for Alzheimer's. Saturated fat, for some people, leads to dementia. So the number one thing that we do know is that people with a certain APOE genotype, and this can be, this can be um, tested with your genetics as well, they are 93% uh, at greater risk for getting Alzheimer's. Now, it doesn't mean everyone with that allele, it's called a four allele, yeah. will get Alzheimer's. But they are at 93% greater risk. And if they have saturated fat, that's what increases that. That's what increases the inflammation. So people say, well, saturated fat has nothing to do with it. Saturated fat doesn't uh, improve or doesn't hurt your cholesterol. Well, it does for about 26% of the population. Mm. That's why you can do a study. 74% of the people did fine. Only 26% of the population didn't do well on it. And it depends who you got in that study. Mm. And that's why, like, if you came to me, I could rig a study. Because yeah. all I have to do is look at the person's genetics, like their genome and their, their body type. And okay. you can literally rig any study you want. Wow. Yeah. So, for, so for brain health, the, people shouldn't be scared of eating carbs. Like, you're not going to be getting Alzheimer's just because you're eating sweet potatoes. <laughs> well, that's the thing, too. Like, what are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, fruity pebbles and right. frosted flakes? <laughs> right, or are we talking yeah. about yams? Like, right. if, I mean, the longest lived population in the world, Okinawans, ate purple sweet potatoes as more than two thirds of their, their diet. Yeah. And they're, they're okay. Right. It is about modulating inflammation. It's about modulating blood sugar, all the hormones in your body. And so, yes, you should do your annual blood work, but you should also run your hormone levels as well. Run your blood sugar. Run what's called your homocysteine and CRP levels. If you have high levels of inflammation, that's going to affect your brain as well. Okay. Uh, so let, then let's talk about the carnivore diet. This sure. has become a popular thing now where, where people are just eating meat. And a lot of people are saying, oh, I feel amazing. I mean, they're probably not years into it, obviously. They're 90 days into it. They're getting their blood work done. Inflammation's going down. What do you think about that? So, I mean, with the carnivore diet, it's like a lot of times in our society, we want to create a diet 
to back up the things that we love, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's what we do. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a proponent of e- actually eating less meat. And here's why. If, and, and that's just why I, I don't think you can back up the carnivore diet. If you look at you and I right now, like my claws are my little fingernails mm-hmm. and my teeth are these little canines. Mm. There is no way in the wild I would ever take down a wild boar. I couldn't take down cattle. Um, right. I definitely couldn't take down an elk or even a deer. Like it would absolutely destroy me, yeah. right? Yeah. And so what I'm saying is, what did humans most likely eat? Like that's what I, I always go back to. Okay, I love the research. I see where people are going with it. I want to buy into it. But does this pass the, also the common sense rule? Yeah. And I say, what would I eat as a human with this body? And I could only eat what I could kill or what I could catch. So humans ate a lot of shellfish. It couldn't fight back, right? We can grab the shellfish right out of the water. Okay. Um, they would eat grubs and worms and crickets. Like nobody wants to talk about that, mm. but it's also why the diet would be so low in protein. Right. Protein would be the harder thing to get. And then we, if we lived, most likely, I believe humans did come out of a warm environment. You get fruit that was all there all year round. Uh, when I studied overseas in India. Uh, bananas, different types of bananas grew all year round. Like all these things grew all year round. That's what we would be eating. And so the idea of eating meat only um, seems a little far-fetched. Yeah. And I would love to- You pointed to- that out in the book where you're like, I agree with the paleo diet, but there's no way a guy would be eating bacon for breakfast and a turkey burger for lunch and a uh, steak for dinner. Sure. And let, paleo, like, paleo. So let's say you got your tribe together. So because yeah. like, originally like humans weren't necessarily in tribes, but then they did because it made sense for survival. And let's say at that point you had a spear and maybe you had a rock or whatever. So then you could start hunting things. But remember, they're on four legs, so they're a lot faster than you. Yeah. And when you did get something, you split it amongst the whole tribe. And some of those people were gathering berries and they were gathering other things that you could eat. And that might be what, like every other day or every couple days and you would right. have a small amount. So that's why I'm a big believer in the the blue zones and the Mediterranean and your protein is a garnish in a meal and not the, the largest amount and probably meat a couple times a week, not not certainly every day, not certainly three meals a day, yeah. you know? So if you're going to be doing that, you most likely have to do, uh, and again, you're doing meat only, but like you'd have to do a ton of vegetables yeah. to balance that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is there anything else you want to expand on, on the low protein? Because uh, I think that's an interesting, especially from a, a fitness bodybuilding meathead community. Like people are freaked out about eating low protein. Uh, maybe expand a little bit more on the, on the health and longevity benefits and will people shrink away and have no muscle on low protein? <laughs> so, yeah, and, and it's a great, because that's what I, I was certainly worried about as well, going from like 275 grams of protein. But the truth is, I what, was- What more, do you eat nowadays, would you guess? I, I'm under 100. Okay. I'm about, um, for most people, I, I'm a big believer. This has been around forever, right? 0. 0.8 grams of protein yeah. per uh, pound of body weight or kilogram, a uh, pound of body weight, I should say. Yeah. Um, and I think that's about right. You know, if like, even if you're trying to put on muscle, I don't think that you need more than half your body weight in protein. Yeah. Now, uh, I do want to kind of put a little caveat there is that the endomorphic body type, much more anabolic. Mm-hmm. And I've actually seen them do pretty well as vegans, but mm-hmm. they can't preach, you can't really preach the veganism bodybuilder thing to an ectomorph. Yeah. Because plant-based protein is not as anabolic. It's just, that's the way it is. And again, like I, I'd love that if it was, but it's just not. So um, it really does depend on your body, your body type. And for the ectomorph in general, you still don't need to jack up your protein. And the reason is that you'll do better when you add more carbs in. Like you'll actually be able to gain more, not because of a lack of fat or a lack of protein, although you should have those, is a lack of carbohydrates. Because your body needs that glucose first, and then it's able to utilize the amino acids to rebuild that. So um, yeah, I mean, there's so much to do about protein. I mean, like, uh, I wish it wasn't true, but it just is. And then things like red meat, uh, which, uh, again, like I love all of these things, but the problem is that they're now finding um, a certain specific type of uh, sugar called, a, it's called a new 5GC, I believe. And that's leading to um, increased cardiovascular. Uh, it's leading to increased cancer, uh, more of an inflammatory-based marker. And Dr. Uh, Gundry actually talked about that in The Plant Paradox, mm. where um, he, he is a big believer in more of a Mediterranean-based diet as well. And it's funny, in that book, the book starts off as about lectins, but really it's just about overall good health. Yeah. And that you can you can really eat lectins like in the long run once you repair your gut. Yeah. So, but it is like, I, I just think that everyone in the functional medicine world who only wants the truth, like that's it. Like, I mean, I, I, it's, I want things a certain way, but that's not necessarily how they are, is that you always come back to certain things where we need all the macros, but protein just cannot be that high. Like that's the bottom line. And honestly, for most people, I don't think fat can be either. 
So what are you left with? Well, you're left with carbs. Well, where, then where are carbs supposed to come from? Vegetation. Mm -hmm. So once you get more vegetables, seven to 10 cups a day, and once you're getting a, maybe a cup or two of berries, uh, you're doing pretty well. Like that's the, that's the majority of the diet. So, I mean, it is hard to get a lot of carbs from vegetables, but well, a couple of things. Talk about, uh, there's so many follow-ups. Whenever I get with you, I want to ask you a million things. Fruit. Uh, you said a cup or two of fruit a day. Uh, where do you stand on fruit gen generally for most people? So what we do for every single person is we do a 21 to 28 day elimination based plan. And I know you've done that yourself, mm -hmm. felt great from it. We do that to find out your, your uh, equilibrium, your homeostasis, right? So we get you feeling really well within a month. Mm -hmm. And then we say, okay, well, what type of person are you? Are, do you? are you someone that needs a little bit more carbohydrates? Because you're a person that loses weight really easily. Well, that's if you lose weight really easily without trying, you're more of an ectomorphic body type. Now, you could be totally stressed out. Like There's, there's a lot that goes into this. Well, for you, I want more starches because what's a carbohydrate? It's energy, right? It's energy-based fuel in the short term. So what we're going to do is your body naturally burns more glucose. So it's hard to imagine that, if you think of it this way, an endomorph that's a larger body type, they convert all of that starch and sugar to body fat. And that's because they're a better burner of, of fat, right? So they do much better on a low carb, higher vegetable, but lower carb, not keto, but but lower carb diet. And the ectomorph does better on a higher carbohydrate diet. And they do that because they're more of a glucose-based burner. You can look at them. They don't have any fat on their body. Like, what are they doing a keto-based diet? Like, they want to tap into body fat. People are saying that. I'm like, yeah, but you don't have any fat in the first place. Right. Like, what are you tapping into? Muscle yeah. tissue? Like, you know, what's going on here? So um, you look at the person. And so what I say is this, is we're going... Um, we're, we're essentially the autoimmune-based paleo, close to that. We just we look at a lot of things like histamines and all those different types of things. We certainly eliminate dairy. Uh, and then what we're doing is we're adding more carbohydrates back in. We're doing certainly the sweet potatoes, the yams, the yuca. Those are non-reactive. We remove the skin, which can have more of the lectins. And then after that, we are actually are adding in things uh, such as nuts for people to test those out. And so that's going to increase fat a little bit. But the other thing we're doing is we're adding grains in, which people are like, hey, you're adding grains? Like, that's that's crazy. Well, here's the thing. Not everybody's reactive to grains. Yeah. And we don't do that for an endomorphic body type where they have trouble losing weight, but we do it for more of the ectomorphic body type. And we'll start with something like white rice. And then people's first reaction is, yeah, but that's high glycemic. And I'll say, yes, but only if eaten in isolation. You know, so when you mix it with sushi or something like that, it's not going to be as high glycemic. And again, no lectin. So we test it. And then if that works, we'll do black rice and red rice and we'll do brown rice or um, we'll do oatmeal. And oatmeal is one of those things that for cardiovascular-based protection, blood sugar can be really great for the body. So it's always the answer comes down to who are we talking about, but through self-experimentation, you can figure all this out. Yeah. Now, oatmeal usually ruins me, but if, if I went through a period where I healed my gut, could that change? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the issue with... The issue with oatmeal we're looking at is, okay, like why, you know, why the reaction? Is it an immune-based reaction or is it bloating? So we can look at it in a few different ways. Um, it really doesn't, so they, they call these foods, they, they contain fructins or uh, sometimes it's sugars that might feed yeast or bacterial overgrowth in your gut. So you can look at that. You can run what's called an organic acids test. But a lot of times it's an immune-based reaction. And an IgE would be like an immediate-based reaction. But for other people, it's, it's it seems more like I get delayed. both almost. Like I get and a runny might. nose, I get, I get a headache, I get bloating, everything. So it, the bloating is definitely a digestive-based issue, meaning that you're either not producing enough stomach acid or you, there's, it's, just, it's being able to ferment in your gut. Okay. So we, what we do is we strengthen your digestive system. So the answer always isn't like this food is bad for you. The, the actually, the, the question should be, why is the food bad for me? Yeah. Why am I having this immune-based reaction? We were talking about eggs earlier. Well, eggs can be a really healthy food for you and contain zinc and B vitamins and choline and all these great things. But egg, again, I've run over 1,000 food sensitivity tests in my practice. Practice and online, when I mean, we ship these things everywhere, and eggs is the number two food sensitivity. Yeah, and it's from an IgG perspective, which means that the reaction you don't even know it. I What's mean, number one, by the way? Dairy, cow's oh, yeah, milk. Yeah. So not goat and not sheep, but cow's milk, dairy. Yeah. And so what happens is, and that includes yogurt, by the way. A lot of people are like, oh, well, no, I'm just having yogurt. Like, oh, well, it's, you know, it's there's still casein in yogurt, you know, and there's still obviously whey. So what we're looking at is a delayed reaction. So people eat a food, and a couple of days later, they're dealing with brain fog or joint pain or fatigue or irritability. 
and they don't know why because the IgG reaction happens days later. So that's Which why I think a lot of people don't know. So I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. That Nobody up. knows, right? Yeah, I mean, I right. wasn't even told that until it was like during my own healing process because I, I, I mean, I was sick essentially from age 17 to age 25. Mm. And I got better, yes, through the years, but I kept relapsing. And so it was only after figuring out these things, which again, like I have no idea why no one tells you about it, uh, but that's how I started to heal as well. I, you can't keep getting, if, like if you have a swollen arm and it's from every day you get punched in the arm, it's never going to heal. Yeah. The only way to get it to heal is you have to stop getting punched in the arm. And the only way to do that with your gut is you have to stop putting in foods into your body that are causing inflammation. And inflammation is pretty simple. It's your white blood cells, it's your immune cells going after a protein. Is going after something it, it recognizes as an antigen foreign from your body, and it creates a little war zone. And that impacts not just your gut, but it actually swells and inflames the whole body. So if people are looking a little softer, a little puffier, uh, the reason is that they're having an overall inflammatory-based reaction in their body. Mm. Now, in the book, you have – I want to read a few of these where you, ha you have this quiz because a lot of people may have these things, but they don't associate it with what they're eating. So I'll just run through. You have the head, sinus, like if you have headaches, nasal congestion, allergies, dark circles under your eyes, itchy ears, red ears, like you said before, uh, bleeding gums, discolored lips, cracking on your lips, uh, swollen lymph nodes, loss of voice, chronic cough, clearing your throat a lot. Uh, what else here? Muscle stiffness, limited range of motion. I mean, there's tons of these uh, dry, flaky skin, excessive sweating, sleep stuff, energy stuff. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And it's funny. So I was going through this and I was like, oh man, I'm going to be embarrassed to tell soon. But I, I had a lot of these last year. I just let things fall apart for whatever reason, too much stress, too much going on. And uh, I had also loosened up on my diet a little bit where I was strict six days a week and then Sunday was a disaster. And that one day just ruins everything, you know? So I did a paleo AIP for 34 days and I felt way better. Uh, I, I would like to get your take on now after that, am I completely healed? So, so for example, I had, I had butter and eggs and those just instant runny nose. So does that, does that tell you for sure that I can't do dairy or maybe you would even want to see further testing and I could heal and, and would be able to tolerate dairy, like things like that. I'm wondering. Yeah, that's a great question. So basically the reason why I have that quiz in the book is that it's broken down by compartments of the body. So the, the book is called The Rain Barrel Effect that you mentioned earlier, and the whole thing is about the filling up of the rain barrel. So we have to understand that, you know, usually as kids we're okay, and then sometimes we start to get sick maybe as teenagers like I did, or maybe even not till like 40, 50 years old, whatever it is. And what happens is that that rain barrel gradually fills up with stress, lack of sleep, you know, commitments, poor eating, whatever, you name it, like antibiotic use, and it just keeps building up. Then eventually it starts to spill over. When it spills over, we see the symptoms. And the symptoms are the sign now for the very first sign that you have either that autoimmune disease, a high cholesterol, whatever it is. And you're like, oh, well, how did this happen? Well, it's been building up over the years, and now finally your body can no longer maintain equilibrium. So that's what happens. We see that. But in everybody's body, it happens differently. Like in my family, everybody gets rheumatoid arthritis. All four of my grandparents and both my parents had uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. I got rheumatoid arthritis when I was 17. So I was like, whoa, like how did that happen? Well, that's in the genetic code. That doesn't happen to everybody. Some people it's Hashimoto's, some people it's high cholesterol, high blood pressure, like that's in the family, but it doesn't have to be that way. And it only happens as you fill up the rain barrel. Now, at the same time, you can empty the rain barrel, right? So when you went on your autoimmune paleo, you started to empty that rain barrel. But the problem is you only emptied it like an inch or two below. So you felt great, right? Because you're not overflowing anymore. So you're yeah. okay. But just below the surface, that's all you are. So now you introduce the dairy or the eggs and boom, it overflows again. Yeah. And you start to feel the brain fog or those symptoms. So what we look to do is a much deeper emptying of that rain barrel where I believe that in today's world with over 77,000 man-made chemicals in the environment, it's yeah. impossible to get rid of them completely, right? right? But what we can do is we can empty that drastically. So then, like myself, I go out and have a cheat meal and I don't get the joint pain anymore. I don't feel any of those things because I don't have rheumatoid arthritis. I don't have Addison's. I don't have myelagic encephalomyelitis. All these things, they're all gone. And it's because I've emptied that rain barrel. But just like you, I've gone back and been like, oh, I'm, everything's totally fine now. And you just start to get too far and they're like, oh, yep. oh, there it is. And I feel that first knuckle on my thumb start to get pain. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, I need to pull back and get back into that cleaner eating. But when you have that blueprint, there it is. Now, the difference with you is I believe there is that issue with eggs and there is that issue with dairy because you're getting the symptoms right away. Yeah. 
what I would recommend is looking deeper at the gut. I would look at an organic acids test. I would look at a food sensitivity test. But the organic acids test is going to show you, is there any candida overgrowth or bacterial overgrowth called SIBO? From using antibiotics or alcohol, poor food combining, stress, Advil, NSAIDs, any of those things can actually start to open up that gut wall, start to deteriorate the good bacteria and allow for the proliferation of yeast overgrowth, fungal overgrowth, or negative bacteria such as like Clostridium difficile. Hmm. Okay. But you can heal all of that. So remember, everything is healable. It really is. Yeah. You just need to know what to work on first. That's all. Yeah, yeah. And then I noticed when I had... Uh uh, I had tacos. I had corn tacos. My stomach was destroyed for about four hours. So the, the corn probably. Corn uh, corn is one of the, the top allergies as well. Yeah. So when we look at the top allergies, and we know this because they've been very well studied, actually right outside of Boston, uh, where, uh, in Boston where I am is Tufts University. And they have a great health services department. They do a lot of research there. And what they found is with, with kids with asthma, allergies, autism, there's a top five allergens. And actually it's, it's for adults as well. But they look at them as wheat, dairy, corn, soy, tree nuts. Eggs are in there eggs are in there as well. And so when we look at those, we say, okay, those are the most common allergens. Let's eliminate those first if we want. We can do food sensitivity testing or not. And then after we've got the body clean, 28 days or so like you did, then let's try to introduce one every three days. Let's have it twice. Okay, within that three days. Okay. And the reason is that the first time you eat it, sometimes it just causes the immune activation not the immune response. It's kind of like, oh, okay, we see that next time you come in, we're going to get you. Yeah. And then that second time is the big is the big inflammation. Now, I want to make a little caveat here because if you eat a food and get bloating, that's not necessarily an allergy. That's a, that's a digestive-based issue, right. meaning that you have either weak hydrochloric acid, you might have H. pylori in your gut that you can do a stool test to, to check for, um, and that, that actually is a digestive-based issue. If you get the watery eyes, the skin rashes, the red ears, uh, the headache, the brain fog, that is an immune-based, inflammation-based response. Mm. Okay. Big, big difference. Yeah. Uh, so before, you, you mentioned that you're not a huge fan of high protein, obviously, but you also mentioned that ultra-high fat you don't believe in either when you're talking about 70% of your diet should be from, from uh, vegetables and whatnot. Just explain, expand a little bit on why a high-fat diet is not the greatest idea. Well, there's... First of all, I always look to what is the research from people who did not care whether it was right or not. Like when I look at longevity-based institutes, so like their only goal, if they're not funded obviously by pharmaceutical companies, things like that, their goal is to figure out what works best. And so when I look at a, a journalist, um, I wish I, uh, I should, I always quote the, the Blue Zones, maybe you know, you know the author's name, it's like escaping me right now. Um, like they it didn't really have a dog in the fight. Yeah. And so I'm like, what did they eat? Like, what, what can I take from this? From people who never knew each other, ate their own indigenous based foods, what do they predominantly have? And so I look at that and I say, okay, like, well, this is one of those ways that we can live longer with better health. And when I look at the blue zones in general or longevity based studies, there's so much that goes into it. Meaning like stress, no matter what diet you have. Right is going to increase cardiovascular issues, it's going to increase cancer, it's going to increase dementia because high cortisol is the worst thing for dementia. So high cortisol burns out those synapses, burns out those brain cells, and so it increases inflammation. So really what we're talking about is a, is a whole lifestyle, and that's why I love the philosophy of the Blue Zones. It's like, hey, getting together with a community, those types of things. And it's also, even if you're a believer in, in eating meat, or higher protein. Again, I'm not saying I'm not. I'm just trying to bring things up for discussion. So, you know, one thing is I always say is if you are, um, you know, fighting against this notion, ask yourself why. Like, why do you care so much yeah. about eating meat or not eating meat? Like, what does it mean to you? Like, what, why? Like, if veganism is the best way to go, like, why not believe in that? Or this is the way to go. So I always question all of my assumptions. And what I've seen right now from all the research is that high fat is not the answer because of the issues also with the gut. Mm -hmm. So when you're on a high saturated fat diet, I mean, there's some studies saying, oh, sure, it can lower inflammation, but that's, that's not, not necessarily true from the fat because you, again, you took out the protein. Mm -hmm. So you can't make, you can't right. correlate that because it's the protein that causes immune reactions, not yeah. the fat, right? So it's the protein that your body looks at, whether it's chicken or turkey and it's undigested, which means they have weak hydrochloric acid, not enough bile production to break down those fats and, and you know, get that going and to detoxify the intestines and the enzymes as well, the pancreatic enzymes to break all these things down. So if they're there in your intestines, and your immune cells are like, whoa, what is this? We're going to attack it. Well, then you get the inflammation. But now you're on a keto-based diet or a high-fat diet, and you don't have that anymore. 
right? So you've kind of taken care of that. So I don't think we can give keto all the credit. I think we can give a lower protein the credit yeah. and look at that. Plus, saturated fats, now this is newer research, are showing that it can actually carry bacteria out of the gut into the bloodstream and it can potentially cause autoimmune based issues as well. They're called lipopolysaccharides. And so it's essentially sugars uh, attaching to fats, moving the bacteria from the gut, potentially things like Klebsiella, uh, Clostridium difficile, other types of bacteria through that gut wall, which is literally a single cell into the bloodstream causing immune based reactions. And that happens with saturated fat. So if you are keto and you are high fat, again, okay with that, use it as an experiment, try it, but use a lot more monounsaturated fat. It's hard to dispute olive oil and avocado. It's somewhat yeah. easier to dispute higher saturated fats and polyunsaturated fats. So that's what I was going to say about olive oil and avocado and even nuts. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the blue zone diet is not really low fat. I mean, certain cultures do eat a ton of olive oil and whatnot. So, uh, and I'm not recommending low fat okay, either. Okay. I'm actually, so of, I'm not recommending yeah. 75% of your diet fat. Yeah, yeah. Um, because any, anytime you lopside your macros in one direction, you're going to have issues. Yeah. And again, yes, yeah, some people should be higher fat, lower carb. And I, I do agree okay. with that, but what's higher fat. So like we actually know this from the research. If you are an APOE, uh, genotype, uh, the allele, so these are specific proteins, is called a two. Very, very rare, but it's more of the Neanderthal, actually, gene, believe it or not. Uh, small percentage of the population, 35% of the diet fat, okay? Uh, if you are the APOE genotype allele number four or a three, four, about 10% of your diet to maybe 15% of your diet fat. Mm -hmm. And then what's the majority of the population? 65, 66% of the population is an APOE genotype three, okay? And so when you look at three, three usually. So when you look at that, you say, well, what's the percentage of the diet for fat for that? 25 to 30%. So if like you don't know what you are, you haven't done a genetic test, um, then probably somewhere around 30% of your diet from fat. I wouldn't yeah. consider that low fat. Right. So now we have 30% of the diet coming from fat and mainly from olive oil, avocado. I don't have a problem with a little bit of coconut oil, things like that. No, no issues at all with that. Yeah. It's when we're talking about, well, we're getting fats now from meat that's been fed corn and soy and Skittles, like we were talking about yeah, earlier, you know, yeah. to fatten it up, then you're really getting the inflammation from that animal as well. Now, some people will argue that saturated fat is more anabolic and that it's more, uh, it stimulates your metabolism more. So if you have, if your body temperature is 96 or if you should be eating a ton of coconut oil and all that, what do you say to that? They're absolutely correct. <laughs> that's what I say to that. <laughs> you know, they're right. So then like, well, okay. So if you eat saturated fat, it's more anabolic. Why? Because saturated fat contains cholesterol for the most part. What is cholesterol? Cholesterol is a hormone. It's a precursor to testosterone, DHEA, and then testosterone. It's actually a precursor to every hormone in the body. So then you have to ask yourself, that's what it comes back to. Well, what's your goal? Like my goal back in the day was to be 200 pounds. Yeah. I ate a lot of fat and I ate a lot of meat and it helped me accomplish that goal. But was that healthy? No, but it certainly transformed my body. You know, I looked like some type of cartoon character, again, that that's not healthy. But at my, my goal was that. So you have to ask yourself, what's your goal? If your goal is to boost testosterone, more saturated fat will certainly help um, because it's more cholesterol in general. So meaning like eating eggs will help. So you always have to ask yourself, is your goal longevity? Yeah. Is it anabolism or, or what is it? Because remember, anabolism also means what? Growth. What does it also correlate with? Increase IGF-1. What does IGF-1 correlate with? Cancer, cardiovascular risk, all the diseases that we're talking about. So it's like, do you want to live a long time? Do you want to be huge? Like, I always say, can we have both? Like, can we, you know, for guys, can we look like the guy on the cover of, of Men's Health rather than muscle and, and yeah. fitness or mu yeah. I should say like muscle development, whatever it yeah. is. Um, and say for women, can you look great, uh, be in, in great shape? And I know that's not the end all be all, but I think you can do that and find a happy medium. I just don't think we need to go overboard. Um, I'm a, I have a little bit of saturated fat for sure in my diet, and I actually think that it's pretty healthy. Uh, but it's when we go overboard and people are doing like literally like bacon wrap burgers and right. like <laughs> bacon has been known for decades to be a known top 10 carcinogen by the Mayo Clinic. And yeah. the, again, the Mayo Clinic has pretty good research to cause cancer. It's one of the top 10. It's right up there with using like Teflon pans. Like, I mean, wow. it does not, I mean, again, most people love bacon and I can't say that I don't love it either, but it's not a healthy food. Yeah. So you mentioned that holy grail there for a second about longevity and being jacked and looking mm. good. Like if you could go back 20 years and you weren't as concerned, well, no, let, let's, let's say it's the perfect scenario. Like how would you do it differently? If you, you still want to be jacked, but you know what you know now and you don't want to be eating a ton of meat, uh, obviously there's always a trade-off. 
Yeah, what I would do. So what I would do now is is closer I am now. So meaning like right now my training is mainly body weight training. But it's it's uh, early spring right now, and later spring into the summer, I want to do more weight based training, like more resistance base. And so, like right now, my body is is pretty happy with where it's at. But I would like to add a little bit more muscle. And so at that time, what I'll do is I will maybe increase my protein a little bit. But for me, I only will do one animal or fish based protein a day. Okay. And I think that that is the healthiest thing most people mm-hmm. can do to find that happy medium. So what do I do? Well, I do just, it's my call my daily nutritional support shake. It's vegan based protein. It's pea and rice based. Okay. And then I'll maybe add in some hemp protein or, or whatever. And again, I don't do any of that right now, but if I want a little bit more protein, then I'll do that. Cause again, I can't get away from the fact that protein is anabolic. Like yeah. that's going to be hard for me to deny yeah. and I won't do that. And then for lunch, I'll do hemp hearts or I'll do uh, beans or something like that as my protein. And then maybe I'll do another smoothie mid-afternoon or not. Like, again, it depends on where I'm at. And then for dinner will be fish uh, the majority of the time for my my protein. Um, I eat eggs once a week. And then maybe I'll do some chicken or turkey or duck uh, one of the other times. And so then that allows me to find that happy balance in my life uh, that also makes my numbers look good on my hormones, my blood work, all because I test everything, right? I test my omega-3s. I test everything. And so that works great for me. And it's big enough for where I want to be right now. So like when I'm feeling and looking good, I'm somewhere around 170 pounds. So right now I'm like 166 or so. So we're not talking about a huge difference, but it makes a difference as you lose a little bit of body fat and put on a little bit more muscle. And now that's a far cry from where I was at 196, right? Mm-hmm. But at 196, I might've been bigger at bigger arms, all of those things, but that's behind me now. Yeah. Like that's no, that's not my current goal. Yeah. And so um, I, I think it's where you're at in life and you can get a low way with a lot more when you're in your twenties yeah. uh, than you can as you start to get a little older. Now that diet you mentioned, you, you talk about that in the book. That's kind of like the standard diet you like That's to right. prescribe for most people, right? Absolutely. I mean, that yeah. that is... Again, like I don't have a dog and in the I love race, that plan. but that's what I've seen work in my, so I, I mean, we've completed, it's crazy, but we've completed a quarter million client appointments. So we have a ton of data. Wow. And we like literally we keep all the data as well. So we have file cabinets and I have a storage unit uh, right outside Boston where I have all of this data. And so when I look at it, I'm like, well, what works well for body transformation? What works well is going, so like people think like, oh, well, you're, you're anti-low carb or oh, you're anti this. I'm not anti anything. Yeah. We're, our first 21 to 28 days is low carb. It is. It's low carb. It's basically vegetables, um, a little bit of sweet potatoes, uh, root-based vegetables. It's no fruit. So I talk about eating fruit. Yeah, I talk about eating fruit because it's anti-cancer. It's phytonutrients. It's those bioflavonoids or bioflavonoids that your body needs. So you want those, but in the beginning, you need to get to a set point, what works for my body, and then start to introduce them. So I don't know where I was going with that question. Oh, a <laughs> diet plan. You're just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then we, we see like this is what works in clinical practice. And the only thing that changes isn't how you eat, but the amount of food that you take in and your macros from your starches. That's what seems to be the right. number. Okay. So it's like, oh, people are like, well, no, this is bad. I'm like, it's not necessarily bad. It's like, is it bad for your body type? Mm-hmm. And with a lot of people, we'll do sweet potatoes at lunch for the people that that put on weight easily mm-hmm. from starches, but we won't do it at dinner. Hmm. So we can play with it a little bit. But I know for myself and a lot of other people, they sleep better if they do some starch at night. Yeah. And I'm, not, I'm just talking about either a little bit of rice or I'm talking about um, sweet potatoes, yams. I mean, we eat a lot of purple potatoes in my house, uh, things like that. And so- yeah, I mean, that the thing is, I don't think it's going to take most people more than somewhere around 12 to 16 weeks to get really well and feel amazing. And then I will think it will take somewhere around six months to 18 months. I mean, it seemed like a long period of time, but you can get, you feel great in 12 weeks. But to tweak things, really find out what works for your body within six to 18 months. And in the long run, that's not that much time for experimentation to see what works for your body. Yeah. And so I love the plan. So the basic outline is, is kind of a uh, a twelve hour fast overnight, and then some some water and lemon in the morning, and then so and this is basically the exact same thing that I'm doing right now. I have hot water and lemon in the morning with some sea salt in it, and then at about twelve hours I will have a smoothie that you'd be proud of. So I have all kinds of greens in there. And what's funny is in the past, as many greens as I'm putting in there now, I wouldn't have been able to digest. I would be, I would, I'd be a mess, all bloated and everything, but completely fine. Which That's is great. a great sign. Yeah, so just a, a variety of greens. I go to the farmer's market and just grab five different kinds of greens. So I p- throw those in. Uh, I put an entire small avocado in. I put a couple berries in. I put one or two mini carrots in. And I put a slice of apple in. And then I'm, I've, I've been using uh, 
So this is one thing I haven't gone back to, but I want to try. I've been using collagen protein right now. So, so I'll whack that down, and, and that's my breakfast. And I feel fantastic. I get no bloating, anything. feel really good. Is that, is that approved? Is that yeah, good? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, so that's the thing is like, you know, people ask me, is collagen good or bad? And I always just say, well, um, if you have histamine-based issues, then collagen is probably your worst nightmare. Okay. And the reason is that uh, a lot of people don't know, but collagen comes from the hide of the animal. Mm. And skins in general are very high in histamines. So if you're someone prone to allergies, um, hives, or uh, itchy eyes, or asthma, yeah. probably not something that you want to do. Okay. But uh, again, I haven't noticed any, test any negative. Yeah. And so it could be again, great for you. Yeah. Um, but at the same time you might say, Oh, well Mondays I'll do collagen. And then on Tuesdays I might do hemp protein. And then yeah. this day I might do rice and, and you might just like figure it out, you know, for yourself. I'm always like, I, I mean, I love what you're doing because you know, humans originally ate over 200 different varieties of, of vegetation. Yeah. So you go into the farmer's market, find out what's local, find out what's in season is amazing. Yeah. I'm more like, I do the same thing on autopilot, like every single morning. Yeah. Um, and then at my, my lunch and my dinner are different. Like my smoothies basically, you know, always, always the same. So I think that's, that's, you know, absolutely fantastic. Okay. I, I've been hesitant to add in, uh, the vegetarian protein yet. Cause I, I don't know how some in the past I've had some weird reactions for some of those, but recently I got one, uh, until I know for sure that it works, I'm not going to say the name or anything, but it, it's, it's a lot of bean like legumes mm -hmm. and, uh, it's brown rice. I'm not sure if there's pea in there. I think there is, uh, there is pea and brown rice in there. And that one seems to do, I've been doing pretty well with that. I know I have an issue with hemp, but again, it could have been when I had digestive issues. Yeah. I, I used to get terrible stomach pain with hemp. Always well, I might, I keep retesting those theories, yeah. meaning eliminate it for six to 12 weeks. Yeah. Try adding it back in. Yeah. And then, cause your body does change, like your immune right. cells change. And so, uh, one thing, I mean, I, I love, I really love picking on keto because uh, <laughs> people are so into keto, uh, they get so defensive about it. And again, yeah. like, well, like why, what does it, why does keto mean to you? So a bunch of the anti-inflammatory benefits from keto just came from that, what we just talked about, the large intermittent fast. Mm -hmm. That's how you drastically reduce inflammation. Mm -hmm. So I'm a huge proponent of the 12 to 14 hour, not really longer for most people yeah. because they're not monks. Like they're not meditating all day. Yeah. And once you get into that sympathetic nervous system, your body wants some type of fuel so that you don't start to tap into your own muscle tissue or converting into to glucose. Because remember, as much as we want to think that we're, oh, we're becoming fat adapted or we're burning ketones. Yes, you are if you're in the calm, cool, relaxed state. Right. But once you move into that parasympathetic and cortisol starts to rise, your body needs an immediate fuel source. Yeah. More of that anaerobic-based metabolism, right? right? And so you need some type of glucose. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just, again, it's like something to think about, really. The anti-inflammatory benefits can come from any diet if you are going like seven o'clock at night to seven in the morning is what I recommend for most people. Okay. And then at seven in the morning, you know, if that's around when you wake up, the lemon and water, like you just talked about, greens, like whatever you want to do then. And then an hour later, 90 minutes later, you can have your smoothie or your breakfast. You've gone now 12, 13 hours or so. You're getting all of those detoxifying benefits. Yeah. I love that you brought that up when you bring that up in the book about why a longer intermittent fast might not be the best idea for people. Now, along the same lines, what about training first thing in the morning fasted? No good? Too stressful? I actually, I like that for a lot of people okay. that are the larger body type, the endomorphic body type, and learning, they're looking to burn body fat. Yeah. And I actually love fasted steady state cardio, which again, I know I'm stepping on so many toes right now. How could you say not interval training? But, you know, believe me, I love interval training as well. But what happens is... And again, you can test this by that glucometer we were talking about. Test your blood sugar upon waking. Test it after you work in the morning. You might find that your blood sugar is through the roof and you didn't eat any carbs. You're like, how can that happen? Well, you put yourself in that stress-based state. Your body will manufacture its own glucose if it needs to for, the, for that. So if you stay in the steady state, yeah. you keep your heart rate 60% to 70% of your max VO2, which, yeah. I mean, it's generic, but you can calculate it pretty easily by doing 220 minus your age, taking 60 to 70% of that. Pretty simple. Um, so what you it went in that state, it's a larger percentage coming from fat. And again, I know that high intensity of interval training, you actually burn more fat, even though it's a smaller percentage. So I'm not saying that. But what happens is you don't get into that sympathetic nervous system state. Mm -hmm. You're not in fight or flight. You just, you know, you're going for a, a, a fast jog, a walking uphill, um, or you should say a fast walk, jogging uphill, or a light jog or a rowing, whatever you want to do. But you're keeping yourself at a lower state. You will actually tap into more body fat and you won't spike that sympathetic nervous system. Now, for the ectomorph, no point. Because what's the point of doing fasted cardio? In my opinion, the point of doing fasted cardio is to burn body fat. No other point, in my opinion, to right. do it. Right. Totally.
So there's no need for that ectomorph, that thin person who might be a hard gainer in the, in the first place to ever do fasted cardio. Right. Not only is it detrimental, they'll tap into most likely their own muscle tissue because they wake up low blood sugar in the first place. They'll be more stressed, more anxious, a lot more inflammation. Yeah, but if, what if they were going to lift? Uh, weight training wise? Yeah. Um, like do you have an issue with them going in, just drinking a black coffee and going to lift first thing in the morning? Is that, is that- as an endomorph, not really, okay. but as an ectomorph, yes. Yeah. So as that yeah. thin body type, then I have an issue with that because it's it's detrimental. Like their goal most likely is to gain muscle. Right. So you don't so have to eat any they protein. Do? They can just eat straight carbs. Okay. Yeah. So that- so even the, just some fruit or something would be better than nothing? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you can just have a banana if you wanted to. Right. It's not a lot of carbs. It's like 40 grams of carbs, but that will at least allow you to use- So all the people are like, oh, you don't want carbs before your workout because your body will tap into that sugar. You're absolutely correct. That's what you <laughs> Want, right, right? right? You want the yeah. ectomorph to tap into the sugar so they don't tap into their own stores, yeah. which will only make them get smaller, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. It's like this you're lifting weights, but you're not getting bigger. You sometimes, you actually, some ectomorphs lose weight when they lift. Yeah. You're like, how is that possible? You're, you're, now your caloric demands went up, your body's rebuilding had to go up. And so um, what happens is, is for those guys and girls, we want more carbs before the workout. They don't even need any of the fat and they don't need any of the protein. Then after the workout, we'll go the carbs, we'll go the protein, and then later in the day, we'll do more of the fat as well. Now the ecto, uh, now the endomorph, the larger body type, just think if you want to lose weight, pretend you're an endomorph anyways, uh, because you're in yeah. at least endomorphic qualities right now. And then it might switch obviously, cause you're, you're back to your normal genotype. Um, then do the fast, do the black coffee. Yeah, totally fine. And why would the black coffee matter for an endomorph? Well, there are, they're in that sluggish base state. Coffee spikes your fight or flight. It gets you into more of that, uh, fat burning mode. Mm-hmm. So take advantage of that. Now, what about from an ideal health perspective in the morning? Let's say you're just getting up and you're, you're doing work, you're going to work, whatever. Uh, is it a bad idea to just have black coffee on an empty stomach? For most people, it is. Yeah. It really is. And, and the reason is that um, you're stressed on your commute to work. You're stressed getting the kids ready in the morning. You're stressed with all the work things that you have to do for the day. And when you put coffee into your body, you're only spiking cortisol to a greater level. You're right. spiking adrenaline. So that's that's normal. That's how you deal with stress. So you might feel amazing. Like that's the thing with all these diets in the short term. Like black coffee and a lot of black coffee, maybe add some butter to it as well. Um, you will feel great. Yeah. But that's because you put yourself in a high stress state. You can't maintain that for a long period of time because you crash. You're just, again, filling up that rain barrel with stress, 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 and then eventually you crash. So that's the thing. And the other reason you feel great is because your digestive system might be really weak. And so if you don't put any food into your stomach first thing in the morning, which is why the smoothie works so great for people because it's mm-hmm. pre-digested, but the reason why you don't feel great sometimes at breakfast in the morning is because your digestion is so weak. You don't have enough energy to break down that food. So it takes all of your energy away from your body, mm-hmm. the normal functions, the cognitive functions of your mind, and brings it to the stomach. And that's why you know we do these things we do these little trials in my practice where if people feel great in the morning and they don't feel great after lunch after a big meal or a normal meal we just say oh that's interesting you know is it the food is it whatever or are you just stressed and so we do is we do so like we know the smoothie works in the morning let's do the same smoothie at lunch do you still feel fatigued tired and bloated after that if the answer is no it's a digestive based issue Mm. it's meaning like they don't have enough energy for digestion, yeah. they don't have enough hydrochloric acid, they don't have enough enzymes, they don't have a bile, enough whatever to break that down, or they're stressed and all the blood's pulled away from their stomach. So like you can always do all these trials as long as you control your variables, you don't change every every anything at once, you just change one thing at a time, you'll be able to figure it out for yeah. sure. So it's the same thing going back to the black coffee in the morning. Um, if you are someone who's totally relaxed, whatever, totally, probably fine, uh, but that's not most people, and I actually don't recommend drinking coffee until after you eat. Yeah. And the right. reason I say that is that you don't get that then that like people think of their anxiety as like energy. Yeah. It's called anxious energy. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not good for you. That's going to burn you out in the long yeah. run for sure. It's going to well, lower your testosterone. There's a huge difference in drinking coffee four hours later after I wake up, after I've had a, a, you know, a shake or some food or something for sure. And huge and difference. I used to have that? it in the morning and I would feel great, but I was just cranking on like nervous energy and anxiety and whatnot. And, and it's, it's never the same day or the same week. It eventually catches up to you. Yeah. So what I'm saying is before it catches up to you, put some food in your stomach first. It will blunt that caffeine's effect. Yeah. It will actually give you a little bit of acidity in the stomach to help break down the food. And then uh, you'll be able to, to get more energy in the body to actually digest the meal. So that's, I mean, that's a little kind of like biohack, as we say. If you really love your coffee, right. you can do that. Or... Um, start to go a little bit more uh, organic Swiss water process decaf, like a half and half, mm-hmm. so you don't get as much of the caffeine spike if you love the coffee. Yeah. 
And w- w- with that smoothie, you don't tend to need as much coffee anyway. Like once you get out of that habit, you know? That's the magic of it. Yeah. Because a lot of times people reach for coffee for energy, right? But if you wake up and you do a small glass of water with your lemon water, pinch of sea salt. I saw you do the sea salt trick earlier. Uh-huh. And you know, that, that's what your body needs. It needs minerals and yeah. it needs hydration. Think about it. If you stop drinking water around 7 p.m. at night and then at 7 in the morning or 8 in the morning, you reach for coffee instead, where's the hydration coming from? Right. You've gone a half a day, a half a day without any water. Your body, it doesn't need caffeine. It actually needs hydration. So now you do the water when you wake up, you do the smoothie in the morning. I call it my purple crush smoothie. That's what I make. And I make that with so much fluid and water that it super saturates my body and I actually have no interest in coffee. I just really enjoy it. And so I don't need it anymore for energy. So like, that's the thing is like, always question all of your assumptions. Right. You know, if you hydrate your body, every cell in your body needs fluid about, you know, 66 to 70% of the body is, is water. Right. So if that much of our body is made out of water, and we deprive it for more than a half a day, you think it's going to be a little irritable, a little cranky, you're going to feel a little stiff in the morning? Yes. So hydrate that body first, then see if you even need the coffee. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny you say question all your assumptions. I found for me, and I've talked to other people who agree, it was almost more so the act of like the comforting feeling of sipping a hot beverage while I'm reading or working in the morning. So now I can go through three to four cups of hot water with lemon and get the same kind of feeling that I had from drinking the coffee without being so stressed out and manic, then have my shake, and then coffee later on, a few hours later, and I feel way better. That's what it is, and that's what we call like an anchor, right? Yeah. And I love that as well. Like if I'm going and I'm sitting down to do my reading for the day, or I'm about to record a podcast, or whatever it might be, or even writing, is... I like that thing beside me, right? Yeah. And a lot of people do. Like yeah. you like the coffee or, or, but you can, again, could it be an herbal tea? Right. So one thing I love in the summer is like a hibiscus tea mm. or I like a, a passion flower tea. And so sometimes like, oh, well, that's not really enough. I might put in some um, like Mountain Valley sparkling water or a little bit of San Pellegrino. And that, is, again, caffeine free, a lot of hydration for my body, but it's like a little treat. And so right. you can always say like, does it have to be coffee? Um, and that's one of the things too, is like, can you do something else? And just remember the first, day is not going to be easy probably not the first week either but you can uh, probably start to wean that out of your diet yeah just a random weird question you mentioned tea there myself and a lot of people i know get sick as a dog if i have tea on an empty stomach you you (laughs) sound like someone with major lectin based issues really yeah and not a lot of population has that um but what happens is these you know so we we consider these things good for us right all these herbs and plants and Mm -hmm. grains but they're they're a lot of times high in lectins like the greens Mm -hmm. previously in the past that might have been an issue so um a lot of people may not be able to handle that and same with um histamine based issues so when you're uh, so teas are actually uh, black tea and herbal based teas a lot of them are what are called diamine oxidase inhibitors that's an enzyme that helps your body, well, diamine oxidase is an enzyme that helps break down histamines in your body. So when T and T's block that, so if you're someone that produces a lot of histamines, which you don't seem like histamine type, um, that can aggravate the stomach as well. Um, I am a histamine type, like a previous with, with allergies and at, like all that type, type of stuff. Um, so they're not great for me, and that's why I'm not always a big proponent of tea. I look at tea, I mean like tea leaves, green tea, mm-hmm. as more of like a supplement. Okay. Uh, because they are, and they can be great for you. So don't get me wrong, but I do better with like herbal based teas that aren't really a tea, right? They're, they're, um, like ginger, for example, or named hibiscus. Mm. They're not a specific tea leaf, like a green tea leaf or a, a white tea or black tea. Okay. So I would try that. I would actually try, um, more like herbal based teas Okay. and to see if that works better. Now you mentioned lectins there for a second. And I, I want to ask your opinion on this, or, or maybe this is a, a fact that I don't know, and I believe I discussed this with Brad Pilon once. Uh, so if you have an issue with certain types of grains or lectins, like like brown rice or quinoa or something like that, if it's in a protein powder, is it processed so much that you won't have those issues? A lot of times, yes. Okay. So that's the big thing about lectins, and and I honestly, I've seen it myself, I've seen it in other people. Once you heal your gut, and even Dr. Gundry says the same thing, lectins aren't really an issue. Yeah. Like, I mean, they are for a very small percent of the population. It's the same thing with like, um, you know, some people are on, uh, going back to keto again, some people, it does lower their thyroid, you know, especially some women, mm-hmm. but it's a certain subsect of the population. Again, you can test that. So heal your gut. You'll probably be better off with lectins, but remember lectins are removed through the cooking process. And the more you cook or process something, the less lectins are there. For example, if you pressure cook something, which I'm not recommending that you always do that, it pretty much removes all the lectins. Right. And, yeah. and then so people are able to digest that. Now, you can make the argument, does it lower the nutrient value, all of these things? Well, you know, again, it's it, to a certain degree, but now you can actually digest that food. Uh, what I say is don't eat foods that are going to be aggravants. 
heal your gut, and then go back and start to introduce those if you'd like. Yeah. There's no, no one says you need to eat beans or legumes to be healthy. It's just like, well, what are you doing instead? And if you're looking for one more plant-based protein that is an animal-based, well, you'd like to eat those maybe one day. Right. You know, so it just gives you more options. That's all. Yeah. But also you have to ask so, yourself. So if someone heals their gut, you're a fan of those? I can be, yeah. Without yeah. it, I can definitely yeah. get behind that because yeah. of um, the research and cardiovascular based benefit, and, and yeah. So remember, those the are staple fermentable. food in the blue zones, right? It, for some of the some, nations, yeah, yeah, some of the yeah. the tribes there. Yeah. Um, but remember, if you, so people with Hashimoto's, with rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune based factors, they may be more susceptible. So we want to watch that to um, legumes and lectins in general. But I really believe that once you remove that candida, once you remove the bacterial overgrowth, your gut is not as fermentable and you're not going to have as much issues with the sugars in those foods because that's part of it. And then when you seal up your gut wall, those proteins will never make their way out of the gut in the first place. So then you won't have the immune-based reaction. Mm. So I always, again, question that assumption. And again, maybe you can eat them in the future, but first do the work to see if you can. Yeah. Now, you have so many great sections in the book, uh, how to decrease stress, how to remove toxins, how to reset your sleep cycle, how to increase your happiness and, and feel good factor. Uh, obviously, we don't have time to get to all those, but maybe uh, you did mention toxins earlier. So let, let's just address that a little bit. Like what, where are, are these toxins getting into people's diet and then sleeping under their skin and whatnot? Absolutely. All yeah. of, I mean, all of the above. So we, we most likely assume there's over 100,000 man-made toxins in the, in the environment now. Um, we know that there's 77,000 man-made chemicals yeah. in the environment. Most of those are, are carcinogenic. They, they form cancer in the body. Okay. So there's a, there's a study that I quote um, in the book that when they want to give a lab rat cancer, because they, they obviously want to give rats cancer so they can see if they can treat it, right? So, I mean, guess how they give lab rats cancer? They expose them to a pesticide that we put on food. So like when we're asking like, oh, why do we have so much more cancer? Like, well, we already know. Like yeah. we already know. <laughs> One of the ways we do that is just by increasing environmental-based toxins. So we get it through the water we drink, whether it's uh, fluoride or all these pharmaceuticals. Believe it or not, when they test city water, they find pharmaceuticals in the actual water, the drinking water. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. Always question all these assumptions. Feel free to do a little Dr. Google search and you can right. you can figure this out. So, I mean, when I, when I flew on the plane here from... Boston to LA, I'm sitting on a seat that's covered in flame retardants that I'm breathing in uh, recycled air that they put, a lot of people don't know, but they put um, antibacterials, they put sprays, they put all these things. So we're getting that into our body, whether it's through skin, breathing, our food, uh, animals are fed hormones, so all of these things. And they're slowly deteriorating our body. And that's the thing. It's like no one meal and typically no one toxin breaks our body down. It just fills up that rain barrel. Yeah. So that's why it's so hard to attribute it to any one thing because it's all of these things. However, there are many people that have gotten sick from playing golf early in the morning or being exposed to high levels of pesticides or sprays. Mm -hmm. And that, cause that is a real neurotoxin that overloads the body. Right. So really interesting to look at that. And then we have to say, well, then yeah, but the body, <laughs> the question I always get, or the reply I always get is, yeah, but the body's always detoxifying itself. And I say, yes, that's true, uh, but not to the capacity that it should be. And so what happens is, what does it do? Well, it takes these chemicals, whether it's plastics from your water bottle or the Teflon or the aluminum that you scrape the pan with or the aluminum foil that you're cooking on, and it takes those heavy metals and it either puts them in the brain, which is fat as well, or it stores them in adipose tissue, which is called fat, right? So what happens is those fat cells expand. That's why a lot of people look puffy and overweight, but their fat cells are actually expanding because of the toxins they're holding onto. I would call that toxic water weight. And that's why a lot of people, they're, you do body fat on them, they're like, hey, though, though, it's just squishy, right? It's not like you know visceral-based fat. So what we have to do is understand that the body is storing away these toxins because the liver, which filters all the blood in your body every six minutes, it can't can't take care of all of these all day long. So what we do is we ramp up all of the ways that you can detoxify the body and they're becoming more popular now, meaning like um, elimination through the stool, elimination through urine, elimination through sweat and elimination through breathing are the ways that the body detoxifies itself. Um, so infrared sauna is becoming popular or sauna. People are talking about it now in my book. I talk about the, how sauna has been around for thousands of years. Yeah. Like, I mean, literally thousands of years, but the most important thing that people can do is a seasonal based detox. Like that's the bottom line. And it's been around since Ayurvedic times, 6,000 years ago. And what it is, it's giving your liver back what it needs 
to filter these toxins. And it's actually quite simple. So it's your B vitamins, it's your vitamin C, it's your glutamine, it's zinc. Uh, it's a lot of the, the vitamins based. So people are getting those like if they're doing a multi or something good like that. But what happens is that ta- then takes the fat soluble toxins in your body and turns them into what's called an intermediary metabolite. Okay. So at this point though, it's still harmful in your body, actually more harmful than if it was stored away. So you need what are called phase two detoxifiers. And these are the sulfur based amino acids. They're things like sulforaphane from broccoli, right? Cruciferous based vegetables. They're the N-acetylcysteine, uh, they're selenium, they're taurine, and they help to promote something called glutathione. And when we raise that in the liver, naturally, natural glutathione, right? When we do that, then the body turns it into what's called a water-soluble metabolite. So then it can be excreted in the stool, the urine, the sweat, or maybe even huffed out as a gas. That's when the infrared sauna, the dry brushing, the Epsom salt baths, the exercise, the deep breathing, that's when those things work efficiently, but only when your liver, which is filtering everything in your body, works efficiently. So that's what we do. We try to do seasonal detoxes, and, and it works great. Yeah, wow. What about, um, let's touch on one more of these, and then we'll, we've got to save questions for your next appearance. <laughs> so uh, just give me a couple of ways to decrease stress. So I always ask people when they, when they come into my practice, so I have something in the book called the de-stress protocol. Uh, because a lot of people, they, they might come to me looking for a vitamin or supplement like they would a pharmaceutical drug. And I want to let them know that that's one part of an eight-part protocol. So don't look to natural medicine as a place in a supplement instead of a pharmaceutical. That's called green medicine. So like as a naturopath or you know, a health practitioner, we kind of make fun of that as well. Because giving somebody uh, niacin B3 for high cholesterol is a lot like giving them a statin. Now, of course, it's healthier. It works in a different way. But like it's still not repairing the underlying root causes of why you have high cholesterol in the first place, right? Yeah. It's just giving someone that vitamin to, to lower it. So what we say is what of, of your stressors, like what is the major stressor in your life right now? It might just be lack of sleep. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's work. And I know you actually work a lot when you're breakthrough weekends on this. It's like, hey, guys, like what's your major thing? Because your major thing is different than my major thing. Right. So we need to figure that out. And maybe it can't change right away. So what do we need to focus on? Well, we need to focus that on all the good stuff we have. Like, you know, that gratitude journal, like really does matter. Like, cause you have so much great in your life. Don't let that one thing crowd it out. Yeah. And then what we also do is we run lab tests called the thyroid adrenal hormone lab test, which is simple, again, at home lab test that looks at your hormone levels. It looks at cortisol. It looks at testosterone, looks at DHEA, progesterone, estrogen, thyroid, all those things. And then we say is, is there something we can do to actually alleviate the stress on the hormones and chemicals. Because then if I can get your body, if I can get your body feeling better from a biochemical based perspective, you'll be able to deal with life better. Right? If your serotonin levels are low and I can give you back more serotonin, well you're going to be feeling better. You're better able to deal with stress. So we look at it from a multifaceted approach. So if you're looking for an easy answer, it's things like, hey, you know, what if you did a hair tissue mineral analysis and your magnesium was low? Well, now we know to use some magnesium. What if um, you're under stress and your cortisol levels were high? Well, we can use a product or an herbal adaptogen that contains ashwagandha, phospholocerine, rhodiola, uh, and, and that can help to modulate stress in the body. And so what we can do is we can just temporarily give you back the ability to deal with better stress as we're working in the lifestyle, right? Because if I can get you less stress, then you're more apt to say, okay, I'll try to go to bed 15 minutes earlier per night every week for a month until I get back to bed an hour earlier. Like an hour earlier to bed, no matter what time you go to bed right now, I mean, it's going to help you out a lot, right? Because then you can wake up an hour earlier, work on your life that you don't get to work on, and now you're going to feel like you're actually accomplishing something. So we really try to work on the whole person um, besides their, their lab work, work on who they are as a human. Yeah. Awesome. My friend, you've done it again. Another five-star, all-star appearance. I love the passion, love the info, love the help you're giving everybody. Uh, What should they do right now? Besides pick up a copy of The Rain Barrel Effect, this is on Amazon everywhere? It is, yes. So basically, the easiest thing to do is just look up The Rain Barrel Effect on Amazon. I have a daily podcast, which is called The Cabral Concept. Um, you know, that's what I just try to just preach this message, teach the message, not say any one person or any one philosophy has to be right. You can find the right philosophy for you. And if people are like, hey, I just want to do one thing, um, you can either 
run your first functional medicine lab test, be introduced and indoctrinated into this world to kind of find out your levels. And you can link that up in the show notes if you want. Yeah. Or do the Dr. Well Detox. Like right now, um, every if you miss this season, spring season, the summer, whatever it is, you can still do it. And what it does, if you do the 21 day, it's a lot like what you followed. And if you feel better in 21 days, just gradually add back in one thing at a time that you didn't have in your diet then and question all of your assumptions. Because what you're going to do along the path is also learn a lot about yourself. So it's always worth it. Like it's always worth it. You can't mess up because you're always learning and you have data points. Track the data. Try it again. It's all trial and error. You're going to figure it out. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. it. Thank you. Guys, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time.